much better. Okay. I don't know how to, I can raise this computer a little bit, that helps. Yeah, uh, this is good, perfect. Okay, let me see if I can um, get something to raise this computer on. Where's this last thing? Get away, dog. This phone on silent. Or it is on silent. No wonder I haven't been getting calls. <laughs> All right. I don't know if I can adjust this any, any further, but how's that? It's perfect. Okay. Hello, Kwali. How are Hello. you, brother? I'm good, brother. Looking good, looking fresh, looking young. Yeah, you look good yourself. I saw some pictures of you on uh, the Facebook, and you had some different uh, hood on and some different garbs on. So looking. Yeah. Uh, where are you? How how is Rio? Well, actually, I'm in um, closer to Brasilia now. Brasilia. Mm -hmm. A place called Alto Paraíso, High Paradise. High paradise. Mm -hmm. Why is it called that? Is it close to, is it surrounded by nature? It is. It's, it's um, the whole place that I live in is one of the largest national parks in Brazil. Mm. And it's um, quite diverse. It has a lot of waterfalls national, and uh, rivers. And um, I think they film Jurassic. Jurassic Park there. Yeah. Wow. How yeah, long so <laughs> how, how long are you there for? A couple months. Wow. Yeah. Nice, nice. So thank you for uh thanking for allowing me to have this conversation with you. It's been a long time coming. We've been trying to plan this for a for a while and uh you're traveling, I'm traveling, and uh, and now it's happening finally. Thank you so much. My pleasure, sir. Yeah, so when I type in your name on Google, uh, you know the Google, um, the first word that comes is a musical artist. Kuali Vasquez, <laughs> musical artist. And so I would like to introduce everyone to Kuali Vasquez. He, you are um, a roadman that is uh, a conductor of uh, traditional peyote ceremonies. Um, you are many things. You are an activist, you are a musician, a world traveler. You're many, many things. And uh, I'll let you, you know, uh, give you the, the stage. Well, thank you. Um, usually, um, People ask me about the the music aspect. It's because um, there's a good friend of mine called, um, well, he goes by his DJ name is Nightmares on Wax. And we recorded something together called Back to Nature. And it, and it has almost a, a, million, uh, a million hits on it. So I think Google sees that and says, well, the most things that this guy's been visited on the internet for is his, uh, his, his song in this with uh, Nightmares on Wax, Back to Nature, kind of narrating some of my points of view on how we should live on Earth, like sharing the planet and making offerings to the Earth first, kind of an indigenous perspective. So that's probably why uh, when you Google my name, it says musician. And then I also have some songs on uh, SoundCloud and the, yeah. But I think what happened was that I was searching for a way to communicate to the world uh, indigenous philosophy. 
which could be summed up in a nutshell as living in harmony and balance with nature. And so through the ceremonies, which uh, we conduct in our native tradition, one of the fundamental aspects of it is to open the hearts and the minds of people so that they can reconnect and reassess their relationship to the earth. And this is what I feel is one of the things that's lacking right now. One of the things that's lacking in the world that could help uh, humans resolve some of the predicaments that they got themselves into, like uh, sicknesses, pollution, economic crisis, poverty, war, you know, uh, social ills, mental illness, all of these things stem from one primary aspect, and that's humans are disconnected with the natural way of living. And so this, this um, the emphasis of, uh, of most everything I do, the music, the ceremonies, and uh, the talks that I participate in and some of the other forums. And yeah, this was something that I learned um, as I, I guess you could say, learned the ceremonies, the rituals. And the more I learned about the rituals of the native people, I've traveled up and down the, the continent of America, North and South, Central. And I've participated with many cultures and participated, especially in the ceremonies that used plant medicines. And what I found is a central theme is that almost all native cultures on this continent, which you call America, both North, South and Central America, they all view earth as the mother, as a female entity that is providing for all non-living and living spirits on what you would call non-living, uh, let's say, I mean, this is a, this is a weird word, right? Non-living. <laughs> I can laugh at myself about that one because everything really has a spirit, you know, it's just a matter of how you understand this word spirit. But they see Mother, Mother Earth as, as the huge spirit that's providing for all of us. And they see the sun as like the father, bringing the light, bringing the energy of the universe, fire, to earth, mixing with the elements of earth, water, creating atmosphere, creating soil creating um, so so they called the the earth and the sun the givers of life and so the most of the rituals are designed to harness the energy of fire the sun the earth the water and of course the wind the, the air that we breathe so this um, basic and fundamental philosophy is what I think is lacking in the uh, so-called modern world. You know, uh, Native people were able to develop technologies that surpass the ones that we are using today. And they still remain a mystery to scientists and anthropologists and archeologists today. They don't know how they developed the technology to, for example, to use plants to cure, to open the mind, how, to, how they constructed their cities, the temples, the pyramids, the rock formations, the spheres, the just everything that they did with stone, the carvings, the gold, everything that they were able to accomplish. Supposedly, they were primitive people 
but this is according to depends whose history book you're looking at, you know. But uh, the development of agricultural technology, plants, basically, I could you say, I don't know, some people have a problem with this word agriculture. Okay, let's take that out of the picture. I reserve the right to contradict anything I say in uh, the interview. So, okay, I'm not gonna say agriculture. I'm gonna say their relationship to plants. They were able to grow so many very plants that the people had enough food to eat where they eliminated the need for war. See, in other places of the world, they didn't have enough food to eat. So they had to raid other people to get the food in order to survive. So they created armies to go attack other people to, for whatever reason. You know? And in, in this part of the world, in this hemisphere, there was so much food that they were able to distribute it and offer it as a way of creating alliances with other sectors of or other nations. You know, they could trade. They, they, if they created uh, groups of people to travel, they weren't like expeditions to go create uh, to assess a war situation. No, they were going to see where there were fertile lands where they could plant seeds and feed more people. And in this way, create alliances with people. So one of the main differences between the history here and the history in other parts of the world is that they didn't have empires. And this, this, is, this is, I think, uh, something that's not understood by a lot of people. The native people here didn't have uh, what you would call rulers, like people that owned everything and then commanded from a hierarchy. According to our own oral tradition and, and what we understand the way we, we uh, were organized, our civilizations here took every person into account and not only the people, but the rest of creation. And so the people that were in charge of the society need to make sure that everything had its proper respect and uh, had its space for it to develop potential. You know, so this was a way that things were more free and allowed for more human creativity. Because when people are fed and they have a home and they have a culture thr thriving and flourishing, languages, art, astrology, astronomy, uh, you know, botany, mathematics, all of this, the creative potential starts moving exponentially. And this is how you could have people create, um, I mean, moving 40 ton rocks carved to fit next to another one perfectly. This is how they could have, you know, a thousand kinds of potatoes, you know, 500 kinds of tomatoes, you know, 200 kinds of beans, hundreds of kinds of corn, you know, chocolate, vanilla, peanuts, popcorn. They sound like a movie. Yeah? The only thing they didn't have was pizza. <laughs> <laughs> So then they developed, they developed. And the things they developed were all based on this. The respect and love for Mother Earth and the elements of life. So <clears throat> what I've been doing personally, how I got involved in this was through the plant, the cactus that uh, grows in Mexico and Texas which is called peyote commonly or Lafora Williamsi if you're talking about the, the genius and the botanical sense. But it also has many names in the native traditions too, like uh, Pajame or Pejuta or Hikuri. And then the spirit of the medicine too has a name that, the, that our ancestors gave them. 
Kamats Kayumari. It's like uh, Kauyumari is like someone that can do miracles. So this little plant, this little cactus that grows in the desert, in the mountains, is of northern Mexico and Texas, has, um, has, has like a, a, a magical power to it. And I was fortunate to go to San Luis Potosí in Mexico. I returned to where he was born and I was fortunate when I was like around 20 years old to partake of a small ceremony, this plant. And uh, so that changed my life. And from that point on, I, I, I saw the power of this plant. And then little by little, I became more of the cultures that had grown up around this plant like what you could call the Native American church in the United States or the, or the Widarika people culture, those that use the peyote in their ceremonies in Mexico, the Mayos and uh, people in, a lot of people in Sonora. And uh, so I, I became really interested in this and I somehow my destiny took me to meet elders that took a light to me and how the rituals are conducted and I earnestly um, participated in them and learned as much as I could and so that's what I've been doing for the year, years or so is sharing these cultures and I've traveled around the world I've been to about 36 different countries more or less I tried to count them one time I hope I didn't miss one out <laughs> I've been to a lot of cities in the United States you know, East Coast, West Coast. Maybe you have uh, some questions you think uh, listeners might, uh, you know, you're a young man, you're, you're involved with a lot of the modern culture. I'm, I'm uh, uh, gonna go next year, so I'm, I grew up in a whole different era, you know. Mm -hmm. When I was a kid, I saw the first televisions come into existence, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> And now here we are talking on, uh, on laptops and computers over thousands of miles. So, yeah, maybe you have something that you think the, your listeners might be interested in. Yeah, um, I mean, I have tons and tons of questions. Because uh, I've been, I think the internet is kind of, uh, hold on, let me just check this real quick. Do you see the lag coming in? Do you see me, my video stopping by any second? Stopping? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if it's my internet or your internet. Um, I it's, think it's mine. I have, okay. I'm in, I'm, in, uh, I'm in Brazil, you know, it's... Uh, so... It's a country, yeah, yeah it's, uh, that's fine. And um, for me, it's, you know, when you describe the modern world and the past, in the modern world, everyone wants to break down the science of things. Why this happens? Why do you feel a certain way? Why do you feel sad? Why are you depressed? You know, then, then they take brain scans and EEG scans and they find out your biochemistry. So for me, it's, um, I'm interested in the spiritual aspect and the scientific aspect, and that's been my journey over the years. And so when it comes to peyote and the main, um, alkaloid masculine it um it binds when it comes to our system it binds to the serotonin receptors so serotonin is the primary chemical that you know for our mood and well-being sleep and different things so recently i found this picture so so serotonin comes in and binds to the receptors and then you know the things happen so masculine comes in and binds to the same receptor you know all the other, um, all the other plant medicine, the same way. They always attach to the serotonin receptors, and this is what I found. Um, let me quickly share this with uh, the viewers as well. Yes. So you see, <laughs> do you see that? <laughs> I <really> do. <laughs> Okay, it just just popped out of in one of my. I'm do, I was doing some research for something. Huh? Okay, that that looks like something familiar. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, okay, let me stop sharing. So, yeah, what's um, it, this is really it's a different medicine, and and you know, over every continent has its own sacred. Uh, wisdom and with the wisdom comes different teachings, different modalities, different practices, and sometimes different uh, exogenous substance that people take in to access different dimensions of truth. And everything has a structure, uh, is you know, in, a, in its structured in a way you have a safe space, you have someone to guide you. And can you tell us how is peyote different from say is the other the other popular medicine ayahuasca what are some of the differences uh, prof like teachings that comes with it from your journey well if you want to know you know let me i hope this doesn't interrupt what we're doing here but i want to show you something you see this plant here Mm -hmm. Do you recognize it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. And now just let me walk a little bit further over here. And do you see these vines here? Uh huh. You see these vines? Yes. Okay. So you take this and you take this. You boil them together for about five days, five days and nights. And you create ayahuasca. Peyote is growing in the desert. All you have to do is cut it and eat it. Mm -hmm. That's the primary difference for me because I don't want to spend five days and five nights over a hot fire just to make medicine I want. <laughs> Well, that's a that's a joke, but because um, I love ayahuasca, and but um, of course you're probably more aware of these uh, molecular components, uh, DMT inhibitors, and this type of thing. What I know is that peyote has about 50 alkaloids. And the most famous one that was isolated over 100 years ago by a German scientist is mescaline. But it also has, you know, another array of alkaloids, which people have not completely studied. One thing I can say about peyote is that I have seen over the 50 years that I've been eating peyote that it affects the production of not only, how do you say it, serotonin? Serotonin. Yeah, but of all the hormones that are produced from the pineal gland, the pituitary gland, the thymus, the adrenals, the gonads, all, all of these glands produce hormones. And this system, the endocrine system is directly connected to the chakras. And each one of these hormones has an energetic effect on you. And peyote has the ability to regulate the production of not only serotonin, but of the other hormones. Some people were even isolating a component of it and using it as a enhancer for sexual activity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the name peyote comes from a, a two words, which means um, heart and glowing. Yolo means heart and peyone means like glowing, vibrant, illuminated. So peyote also can open up this part of your, the, what, what's being produced and make, your, make you feel good. Make you, it increases your capacity for love and compassion. 
This is one of the effects of the chemicals, the alkaloids that are in peyote. So you see how it works on the entire system. Now, ayahuasca DMT has more to do with the cognitive, the, what's going on in your brain, how you're perceiving things, how you're interpreting your reality, what's coming into, what, what ideas and how your, your internal vision, you could say. When you close your eyes, the visions of ayahuasca do not go away. They're inside of your, your, your how do they say this, um, cognitive process. And ayahuasca doesn't necessarily have the same effect on the rest of your uh, endocrine system. So that's two primary differences I would say about peyote and, and ayahuasca. And also, I mean, based on my experience, um, the information or the wisdom from those specific plants. What I saw uh, for peyote, it was more real time because you know we sit down by the fire, you are in a group of people and you are conscious of everyone and you participate versus um, uh, in ayahuasca, you might be going on, in, on your own journey. So that's what I saw uh, from the message that's coming to me from those plants. Undoubtedly, yeah. Peyote can be used for dancing rituals um, because it enhances your sensory perception. Like it doesn't incapacitate you. Of course, ayahuasca also is used for, for playing music. It like really tunes your, your guitar abilities. Mm -hmm. Like when I started coming to Brazil, uh, I really noticed how bad I played the guitar, you know. And it uh, inspired me to learn how to play it better because, like, ayahuasca really hones your uh, your music, um, your, your, your intonation, you know. <laughs> yeah, the last, uh, you've probably been to Shibalba in uh, near Playa with uh, Brother Oscar. Silvalba, yeah. Oh, yeah, near place. Yes, yes, I have. Yeah, during um, um, month, month, I think last on the 14th of February, Valentine's Day, I come back. Uh, did you know after after the ceremony, I come back to Tulum, and my guitar was lying on the bed, and the first thing before I before even I go to sleep was just <laughs> just as you describe, work on a little song. But yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, there's amazing acoustics in that uh, that temple that you mentioned. Yeah, like so. Yeah, there's a there's actually a temple next door to where I'm staying here, and this is uh, yeah. Ayahuasca is great for like um, group singing. Now, there's different types of ayahuasca too. We should we should mention that. You know, there's some ayahuascas that that are super strong. And they almost have this effect like a boga or something where they just completely, as you say, transport you into a, another reality where you almost don't even know what's going on around you. And then there's other ayahuascas that you drink and it just turns everything into crystal clear, very refined um, vibration. And uh, yeah, so there's, there's many types of ayahuasca. In each, in each ayahuasca, that is brewed, you could say, has the characteristics of the ones that are brewing it. And the prayers that go into it, the songs that go into it, and then some people even add other, uh, other plants. So ayahuasca can be very um, different. And even the same ayahuasca can be different one night after another, mm -hmm. even one glass after another. You could drink one glass and uh, it could be one experience and then you drink the second glass and it could be another experience and then you drink the third glass and it could be another experience, you know. Peyote, I, I found that it, it, um, 
Of course, it can also be varied, but there's a more of a consistent effect on the people that participate. You know, it can be, I think what peyote does, I, I would describe it as a mirror. Like it shows you yourself, you know, this is, it's like a truth serum. And it uh, helps you to, to do like self-reflection in the sense that it, it shows you your life, what, okay, what you wanted to do, what you're able to do, you know, it, it gives you more impetus, more uh, energy to accomplish things. This is what I found in my own life. And I've also spoken to hundreds of people that have come to the ceremonies. And I think this has also been the case for them. Like, let's say they were addicted to alcohol or heroin or cocaine or something, and they wanted to get off of this addiction. Somehow after the ceremony with peyote, they found the, the willpower and the energy to free themselves from this addiction. Or maybe they had a personality addiction, like to anger or to depression, or, and they were able to, you know, uh, shift and become more calm or less paranoid or something like this, you know. So, and like you, like we said earlier, it may have to do with the production of the proper amount of certain hormones, mm -hmm. but in any in any uh, in any case, it was effective in changing their uh, their behavior to one that you could say more healthy you know and you've also mentioned um of certain miracles of uh, in terms of health and well-being um you know you have the emotional health and you have the physical health can you speak uh, what's your experience what you have seen in your um in your time as uh, being conducting the ceremonies? Well, um, yes, there, for example, in the physical sense, there have been like tumors that have like disappeared. And um, at first I was a little incredulous myself until I, I actually saw that Chinese doctors have kind of videoed uh, tumors being dissolved through like it's almost like prayer or or positive vibration that they put on a patient like this team of people can actually put prayers and they show on a on a graph on a kind of like an x-ray machine where the tumor is actually disappearing and uh so basically this is what it is the peyote enhances the vibration of the entire people there and they're praying for somebody and I've seen it happen. It doesn't happen all the time. I mean, it's not like, okay, everybody that have cancer, come to a peyote meeting, you're going to be healed. I wish it was that, but sometimes there's other factors involved. But I did see it on, on one occasion. And I've also seen people uh, get rid of their um, anxiety medicines, prescriptions, their depression prescriptions. Um, pharmaceuticals that have been prescribed to them for these uh, for these cases. And um, I've seen people, uh, yeah, they can have, uh, what, pains, back pains. A lot of people come, they were in an accident, they had like, uh, you know, they suffered an accident and they've had like a chronic pain. And after the ceremony, they're, their pain went away. They said they noticed during the ceremony their pain was gone and then and it like never returned. And um, yeah, I think, like I was saying, you know, a lot of addiction is due to a lot of depressed situations. People, they just don't want to face the reality. And I think once they, they're able to do that, I mean, people have gone through a lot of trauma. One thing I found out by traveling the world, there's a lot of abuse, you know. A lot of women, a lot of children suffer abuse, you know. And then when they're when people are adults, men too, but more more when when uh, when men are young, unable to defend themselves, or women are are being and and a lot of this surfaces in the ceremonies. And 
then people are able to like how can you you know what's a good way to say it? get over it or or to see it in a different light or let it stop affecting them you know because i kind of i kind of try to talk people through this too you know like okay you had something happen to you in your life but it doesn't mean that this is needs to be the thing that defines your reality today and in a way we try to transport ourselves back to that moment and try to rearrange the result of that you know instead of making the person angry or weak or something we try to switch the energy so that it makes them more compassionate more loving not only with themselves but you know they can resolve all that animosity that they feel and things like this you know like uh, society is full of abuse you know uh, i speak about that sometimes you know the a lot of societies have class systems caste systems racial divisions you know uh, so yeah there's a lot of human on human uh, exploitation and discrimination and yeah inflicting on, on humans inflict on other humans a lot of emotional and spiritual trauma and uh, the ceremonies are, are an opportunity to view it all in another in another light and this sometimes has a profound healing effect on people I like the way you, uh, in one of the videos, uh, one of your interviews, you describe how um, doing ceremonies while you are, you know, having, ingesting the plant medicine, it takes your consciousness at the molecular level where you could actually separate yourself from, you know, your realities, separate of your lower identities. And from then you have the power to, navigate or the potential to sort of see things in a different light yeah i mean you take mushrooms mushrooms i mean i'm sure other people can speak probably more profoundly or more intelligently or have a lot more information than i can possibly share but i see mushrooms you know and i see the way they grow and how they are in the earth you know and how they spread and how there's so much um connected to the earth and when you ingest them you become they become part of you and you become part of them you know this idea of separation of you know um begins to dissolve and you really can feel yourself as part of the plants you know and this is another level of consciousness you know humans are stuck at the human level of consciousness you know this uh this reality you know this human reality they don't lots of times they don't realize that the heart is an organ that has a consciousness not only the brain you know and each organ has a consciousness there's a story about a, a woman who received a heart transplant and she started having reoccurring dreams of being attacked in the park and she even went to the police and they drew the picture of the guy that was attacking her then they found out that she had received a heart from a woman who had been murdered in a park and they were actually able to capture the person who had committed the crime there's a book about it i forget the title i used to know the title of this book but th what i'm basically what i'm trying to say is that each cell has a memory each muscle, each part of your body, your organs, your, your eyes, your brain, everything makes you up. And just the same way, all humans make up society. And we're no different. We're like a bunch of cells, like a bunch of ants, like a bunch of bees working together in the society. And you know that when you see ants, they're all, they're all basically coordinated. They're all <laughs> going to do the same mission you know but humans somehow they want to be by themselves and then they get into this mental illness they lock themselves in a room and then okay now what do i do this is not the way humans are supposed to live 
okay, so they developed these computers to connect, but this is still not the way they're supposed to do. It is a way to connect, undoubtedly, but I think we would live a much more healthier existence if we were dancing together and singing together and eating peyote together. And mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really, really um, profound thing, the way you talk, spoke about the, the cells, right? One thing I really like about um, ev every tradition has their wisdom and magic. Um, if you look at the Eastern traditions, like, you know, Qigong, Tai Chi, it's all about connecting to those organs, like using your power, vibration, or Qi or Prana. How do you heal your different parts of your organs? How do you send blessings and love to those cells? And it's really, really powerful. Um, and yeah, and then, you know, if you, uh, then you move to the Indian subcontinent, you know, you have yoga it's also how do you connect to the bodies and um one of the things that made me super super curious was um like this ancient technology priority or ayahuasca all these plants what what do you think how did they end up here in this planet do you think there was um, some sort of um, ancient civilization that knew uh, could predicted or just planted this out so that humanity, when they needed it the most, could find its way uh, through this, you know, beautiful medicine that has the potential to, you know, change our consciousness. What, what's your take on that? This is, a, this is very possible. And uh, it doesn't take much imagination to, to see how this could be um, the case. And in fact, in the years that I've been drinking ayahuasca, which have been like over 20 years, I have heard tales of people that were, I guess you could say enlightened, if this is a word that people understand, that they, that they were already into this realm where they could move through different dimensions, that they were not stuck in the human reality because they had realized that yeah they're part of everything so however you understand this state one of these people went up to the sun and on the sun there was a garden and he noticed this plant that was emitting a particular light so he was walking through this garden and he took a branch from this plant and the moment he cut that branch he became aware that some beings on the planet and the sun were coming after him. So he started running and then he, he felt the energy of this plant that he had cut on the sun. But then he also remembered that he was on earth, that he was meditating that he was on the sun. So he meditated himself back to earth. And when he returned to earth, he had in his hand, the plant that he brought from the sun. And this plant was the vine, which is used for ayahuasca. So maybe these are stories, who knows, maybe they're true. You know, maybe there's, there's different ways that you could interpret this, you know, that someone could transport themselves to another part of the solar system or another part of the galaxy and retrieve something to be used in this reality. A very similar story is, is the story of corn. Now, if you look at corn, scientists say, oh, the people in Mesoamerica developed it from a grass. They probably use botanical selections and developed it from a grass. And they even have a grass that they say, this is the grass that was used to, to make corn. Because corn, you need to plant corn. You know, like if a piece of corn just falls on the ground, it's very unlikely that that is going to turn into corn. You need to put it in the ground. You need to cover it. You need to make sure that water reaches it and this. What our story about corn is, is that another enlightened being 
who was named Quetzalcoatl, a man who reached this state of harmony and balance between the material human existence and the spiritual energetic planes, transported himself to another dimension and sacrificed some of his blood to bring back corn for the people in this reality. So when we talk about what is possible and what is impossible, you know, we see on Star Trek where people dissolve their molecules and reorganize their molecules in another planet or back into the spaceship. And this is the imagination of, you know, some writers, but who knows? They might be based on previous memories of humans that were able to alter their molecules and transport them in the form of light by following certain wavelengths that are coming from the cosmos and kind of attaching themselves to these light frequencies and actually rematerializing in other places. Things that, like I said, our, our scientific knowledge of existence maybe hasn't advanced to the point where we can grasp these concepts of transportation through vibration, through light. But um, I've eaten peyote and looked at the fire sometimes. I can actually see like different, um, like a person materialize in, in the ceremony. And it could be an ancestor, it could be a relative of someone, it could be someone from another planet, another reality. And they're there to help us. They bring healing energy, they bring, you know, messages, they bring... So when people eat peyote and they're around the fire and they create these portals, this is why these are... It's common for people to see things happen in... in ayahuasca ceremonies and peyote ceremonies, mushroom ceremonies, because now the, the mind is operating at a different frequency. Because all thought is, is it's waves, you know, this is why people say, you know, Quetzalcoatl, they're waves. The, the serpent is a very important concept in pre-modern times because it symbolizes the way matter moves. There is a, a, a book I was reading when, I mean, I'm, I'm in New York City right now. I was traveling for a bit, but right before December, November, I used to live close to Central Park. And I was reading this book, The Cosmic Serpent. And, you know, it describes uh, the, I think it was an ethnobiologist or social or anthropologist. He was seeing the different drawings of um, ancient uh, you know, art of people, um, ayahuasqueros, the people are, you know, who conduct uh, ceremonies, and how they envision the, serp uh, the, the, ser um, the fissures between the two halves of the brain as serpents. So I was reading it. That was like my morning reading ritual. And um, that day I decided, okay, I'm going to take some uh, mushrooms and go see... Uh, the sunset in Central Park. So I have my mushroom and I, you know, I was walking to the park with my, ready with my music and with the blanket. And I was about to jump. There was this place where you are not, you're not supposed to be there. Like there's a fence over it. But I decided to you know, jump anyway. And my leg got scratched by the fin. And funnily enough, it was, the scratch was, took a shape like this, of a serpent. So that was my little serpent moment um, with, uh, yeah, it's uh, serpents. If you look at the Hindu mythology, you know, there was, uh, there is the Shiva's drawings. You have serpents on his sides. They're gods. Uh, apparently, they have godlike status in a different dimension. So there are so many, so many stories. And that's one of the really great things I like about the shamanic tradition is how they use animals as symbolism and how we can find wisdom 
through certain traits connected to those animals like jaguar, the eagle. So you have uh, anything to say on that? Yeah, so in our language, the Nahuatl language, I say our language, the, the, the people of Mexico, before the Spanish came, the language many people spoke were based on a large language uh, group. It's called Nahuatl. At, A-T-L, means water. Nahuatl means to speak like water to the four directions. So this is the name of the language. The first number in the Nahuatl language is ko, and it, it's a spiral. The symbol is a spiral. So you combine ko, the spiral, with at, water, and this is the name for serpent, koat. So what they're explaining with this word koat is that if you look at a serpent, you will see how material is organized in its movement. It's like a spiral, but not only is it a spiral, it's also a wave. So the serpent is used as a concept to explain the original structure of matter. When you add it with Quetzal, Quetzal Koa, Quetzal is a beautiful bird that flies like this. It's an iridescent green bird that flies and it refuses to live in captivity. So it, rep it represents something very ethereal, something you can't capture, like a thought. You can only think a thought, you know, you can, nobody can, well, I don't know, maybe nowadays with technology, who knows, but, but anyway, so they combine this Quetzal with the Koat, so you have matter that's spiraling, flying, water, air, and so then they come up with, a, with a, an image of a feathered serpent, Quetzal Koat, and this is a powerful symbol because it contains many different concepts which could you could say are like foundations of modern physics you know how everything is vibrating how everything is spiraling how everything is you know uh operates according to different frequencies sound light matter you know photons proton, protons neutrons electrons all of this are waves of light. So yeah, this is uh, this is one of the most powerful ancient concepts of of the people that lived in uh, in the ancient cities in Mexico, Teotihuacan. They have a whole temple where this image Quetzalcoatl is on the walls, along with another image which is Tlaloc. And Tlaloc means the drink of the earth but it also means the drink of love and the drink of light. And Tlaloc is the name that they give to rain. So these, com these combinations, in other words, they put Quetzalcoatl, Tlaloc, Quetzalcoatl, Tlaloc. So they're combining on the temples that are harnessing cosmic energy for the consciousness of humanity to develop. So they build a temple, they put these images, and they harness the energy, and they put it on ley lines on the Earth's magnetic grid, and then they send these concepts through, through the energetic field of the Earth, through invocations, through ceremonies, through... So they're, they're using this to heighten the, the level of, of uh, vibration of, 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 human, of human thought. It's a, lot, it's a lot more complicated than what I think people actually understand of the ancient civilizations, their symbols, such as the serpent and the jaguar and the eagle. The eagle represents the sun. And one of the concepts of the creator spirit is the eagle of fire that's flying like through the universe, bringing all these uh, stars, 
and galaxies and spiraling and creating a creative force like an eagle of fire and the suns and the stars and all this are like created by this great eagle mother spirit of fire kind of like a phoenix rising out of nothing you know so these are like symbols to represent the the way this world manifested the way it created the way it was created and then the jaguar a very powerful animal that can swim underwater you see videos of jaguars swimming underwater with their eyes open you see them in the trees lounging in the trees you know and when they leap from the trees it's almost like they're flying i mean they're they're you know quite a few meters, quite a few feet up in the tree, and then they're just springing from trees, flying through the air and capturing animals. And of course, they're, they're on the earth. So yeah, the, these animals represent the forces of nature. If you've ever been close to an earthquake and you hear the sound of an earthquake, it sounds like a jaguar growling. So, and it feels like a serpent moving when you feel the vibration of the titanic plates moving. It, it, you, see, you see the earth, it's a wave. So this is how the ancients were able to communicate. Even though you don't speak the same language, like right now we're speaking English. I'm sure you speak other languages. But these symbols are universal languages that could be used to understand natural phenomena. That's it. It's, uh, it's, it's magical, poetic, uh, also it has romant romanticism in it, but it's just like the whole creation is, the more deeper you go to the ancient wisdom, the more you the more curious you become, the more you fall in love with the culture. Because we have this tendency right now, we think that a lot of the modern people, you know, it's like we are always looking for the next technology to build, to, you know, solve some problem. And the more we go forward, the part of us think that, you know, the ancient is just ancient. But then the more you look back, the more uh, profound wisdom you, you know, come across through different traditions and cultures, yeah. So true, so true. This uh, idea that humans lived in caves and then they developed fire and then they started cooking food and they became, this, this is, um, my own personal belief is that this is not true. That this is one of the theories that have been fed to us in uh, you know anthropology books and classrooms that is incorrect and it's fed to us with the purpose of us thinking that we are presently in a very evolved state compared to when we used to live in caves mm. and hunt with spears. When in actuality, the older you go into the ruins that have been left by previous civilizations, the further back you go, the more advanced they were. <laughs> And it seems that we're going, we're becoming less intelligent and less technologically uh, proficient in our way of living on the planet. So there's something wrong with that picture, with that movie about, you know, all of a sudden a caveman finds fire and then starts, you know, developing. I think that the origins of humanity on this planet are still a mystery. 
but that the mystery can be solved if we're open-minded about it. And this card, like 90% of what we've been taught up to this point, as far as the origins of humanity. Our native people have a completely different understanding of how humanity was, um, how could you say, how, the, how, how humanity was um, initiated and also what were the origins of the civilizations. Because in Mexico, to take one place, for example, there's these huge colossal heads that were formed out of basalt, volcanic stone, that was transported all the way from where the volcanoes were to the beach in Mexico, and then carved. They weigh like 40 tons, 20 tons five tons, whatever, the smallest ones. And then some of them were even taken to an island off the coast of Mexico. And one guy tried to say that they were done with, uh, with rafts. So he brought just a, a, a piece of volcanic stone weighing five tons and tried to move it with a raft. He tried to actually construct a raft to move it to the island. And that piece of stone is still stuck there on the beach. <laughs> from his failed attempt. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. People, and these are some of the oldest carvings in Mexico. So that's what I'm saying. The, the further back you go into history of humanity, the more astounding the technology was. Absolutely. Yeah. I have so. different beliefs, my own, my own personal, I'm sorry, I don't want to interrupt you, but I have my own personal understandings from things I've seen in ceremonies that say that we are connected physiologically, biologically, spiritually, and with our thoughts, with other civilizations in the galaxy. And I think this is a common thread among native uh, understandings all up and down North and South and Central America. Perhaps we have forgotten. Yeah, I mean, in South America, they have these huge lines that are on the side of mountains, which are perceived from an aerial view. So obviously they had some form of craft that was flying that could make hummingbirds and snakes and other figures that are found on earth. So why would someone flying in a craft make a design of a hummingbird, for example, unless he was trying to convey message of something that the humans were going to be able to relate to? Yeah, I, I, I love the concept of the whole reality, the whole consciousness moving as a form of art, moving in mystery, move things we are trying to solve. This gives us a new dimension of excitement, encouragement. Um, and yeah, thank you for sharing. And uh, from the uh, time we have, I want to discuss uh, one or two more things. Um, speaking about the peyote button, uh, buttons, um, for now, in my understanding, it's uh, found in northern Mexico, southern Texas, and parts of Peru. But also, they're endangered. Can you speak a little bit about that and you know how we as a collective can take some actions um, you know, in trying to conserve this technology that is you know, helping, uh, has, has been helping us, has been a guiding hand through our time? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, as you mentioned, there, there is a threat, and the threat is modern society. Why? Because the plant left to its own natural 
uh, development will continue to grow. It multiplies very quickly. And it, and it develops in its natural habitat. And the problem is that its natural habitat is being overtaken by modern industries. And I want to distinguish between the use of peyote and the increase in the amount of people that are eating peyote. This does not affect the existence of peyote. This actually could be a factor that enhances the more people that eat peyote, the more it could possibly grow. Whereas on the other side, the, the eradication of its natural habitat through mining, through cattle industry, through oil, through developing homes and shopping malls and just normal you know highways and all of this modern technology is encroaching upon the natural places where peyote grows so one effort could be if if any of your listeners have this idea to help conserve the natural habitat there are some efforts of people that want to purchase large acreage of land in Mexico and in Texas and designate them for the the conserving the natural habitat of, of peyote. And the same could be said for uh, San Pedro in South America where the cousin of peyote, San Pedro's grow very tall. They're, they're, they look completely different. Peyotes are just little cactus. They grow, you know, maybe an inch or two in height naturally. Whereas the San Pedro's grow many feet, you know, 30 feet tall. So yes, but both San Pedro grows really fast and peyote is even being grown by many of my friends. I send them, I cut little peyote buttons and send them to them. And uh, yeah, they, uh, they reproduce rather quickly when taken care of. And once the peyote develops its root, you can cut the root, cut the, the top part and replant it, and the root will produce more. So there is a way to grow more uh, peyote uh, in your own home in large quantities. You could order seeds and uh, germinate them. And I mean, it will. it's one of the slowest growing plants, but people have had great success growing peyote in there in their greenhouses. So that, there's two, there's two part, there's a two uh, answers to that question of what we can do to help peyote. And one of them is to preserve its natural habitat. And the other one is to start peyote gardens, mm -hmm. wherever you are in the world. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wonderful. Thank you for uh, sharing. And finally, I would like to, um, Right now, I mean, I've been discussing this with other people as well, and you know, mm -hmm. you have plant medicine or psychedelics and theogens, whatever thing you prefer to call it, they're available, and anyone can access it in different parts. But since it's available, and sometimes people go for it unprepared, unprepared with not the right intention, the right, the right mindset. And like, you know, I was looking at this video of this guru, uh, who is this yoga enlightened guru. And he was, he's, he's not into um, an exogenous substance. He's more like, you know, build it up internally. And I'm sure it's, it makes sense because in the way he was talking about it, it's like, you know, when sometimes people reach all these higher states and then they come back to earth, but then their life is not, there's a huge mismatch between what they have seen and what they have, uh, you know, felt or, you know, viscerally and their normal life. So it doesn't, the effects, the healings does not last long because they continue the same path. So there has to be an alignment of, you know, your work here on earth uh, without anything. And then from time to time, you seek wisdom in the right container, in the right structure from this ancient medicine so what how can we 
what are some of the ways uh, you'd like to tell our listeners some practices we can, you know, um, bring in, in, in this reality, in this life, so that we are ready uh, whenever time comes, you know, for other wisdom, other things. Well, if you go to the ceremonies, as you said, it's important to have an intention. And what's an intention? Intention could be described as a thought, as a prayer, as an idea, as a feeling, an emotion, you know. Why? Because this will give direction to your experience. Now, if you come in, some people say, well, I don't want to have an expectation. Okay, we're not talking about an expectation. We're talking about uh, an idea of something you want to see manifest in your life, in your reality. Why is this important? Because most, most people that accomplish things, it's because they have had a vision, a dream, an idea, a thought of what is possible, what they can do, what they can create, what they can paint, what they can invent, what they can, you know, uh, somebody they can help, something like this, you know. And this will help the person harness the energy of the plants. Because the human body, the human spirit, the mind can absorb ideas, it can absorb physical energy. And then it can transform it into a different reality. So true that the, 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 the guru from India says, okay, I don't want to smoke marijuana. Why? Because it, it makes me think all of these things, you know. Okay, well, maybe a person doesn't have the ability to dream. Maybe they lost the ability to dream. Maybe they lost their creative abilities. They're stuck in a modern situation where they do the same routine day after day, get in a car, drive to work, come home, feed the kids, go to sleep, get up, take a shower. Go. They need something, some plan, something to stir their creativity. Maybe they don't even read books anymore. You know, I like to read, I read poetry, I read fiction, I read science, you know, updates, physics and Qigong and all these things. So I'm, I'm constantly feeding my mind with thoughts and ideas. You know, I try to learn to play the guitar, different chords. Some people might not have that. So they might be able to go into an ayahuasca meeting or a peyote meeting and actually receive something that will inspire their creativity, inspire, give them more willpower to do something different than what they're doing right now. So it may be true the guru may not need this for himself because he can already do this. But some people need plants to help them. So this is why they started calling plants medicine. In our, in our culture before, we didn't used to call it medicine. But now they call it medicine. Why? Because some people need it to, to, to help fix it. <laughs> so like this. And then the other thing is, is to be able to, um, to understand that the reality you live in is just a product of your own thoughts. So if peyote and ayahuasca can help you to think differently, then the effect will be lasting one way or another. And that's why a lot of people say, well, I have, I, I said, ask them, have, have you ever eaten peyote? You're talking, you're talking this like if you know what peyote is about. And they, no, I haven't eaten peyote, but I read a lot of books and I've talked to a lot of people. I go, well, then you should try it at least once before you make these comments. <laughs> Experience is the foundation. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, one of the practices that um, I think this might, um, I found it in ceremony and maybe uh, you, might, you might be responsible for 
sharing this in a story I cannot recall was uh, in the morning uh, when you're drinking the water, drinking water, you send, you have this one-on-one -on -one time looking at the water, being grateful. Uh, these practices that you bring in from with these experiences and then you begin to integrate it in your life in different times, sun, light, earth, more ethereal connection to nature, and then you know lowering the gap of separation. That's been my journey and I hope to improve and learn and uh, it's, it's, it's a never ending journey. Uh, and uh, yeah, thank you, thank you very much for, for this uh, time. Um, and I'm really happy to have uh, gotten this moment to share this with you. And, and I've sat down with you maybe once or twice, perhaps, and I've sat down with your students. Uh, so yeah, um, any, uh, any final words or thoughts uh, before we close this session? Yes, I will just uh, reiterate what I began with, standing the elements and the power of the elements. And, and you reminded me of this when you talked about the story that I tell everybody and drink a glass of water in the morning, take a few deep breaths, uh, feel the earth underneath your feet, you know, feel the light of the sun coming in, gratitude for this reality, you know, this existence. If you don't mind, I want to show you. Want to see if some monkeys in the trees around here? Oh yes, that's uh, it. Has to be in the video, absolutely. Let me see if I can get them to it. But but I'm gonna try to show you these little monkeys. There's one. Do you see them in the tree? In the tree? Uh, do you see a little monkey right there? What part oh, of the? Ah, yes, I do see him. It's. Uh, you see him? There's a yes. whole family. Look, there's another one over there. Mm. The tiny one, the tiny. Tiny little monkeys, yeah. Little gray monkeys with little gray tails. They don't, uh, they, do they interact with you, try to steal your stuff? I fruits? feed them bananas. They'll come and eat a banana. Maybe I should have brought a banana. We could have fed some of them. No. <laughs> Pets. <laughs> Well, thanks again, brother. I hope to see you in, um, in New York.